since I mentioned this, turn over to Romans 8, if you would here. This is not the message right now, but look over to Romans 8 here. If, if you don't have this verse uh, either marked in your Bible and or memorized, then let me uh, strongly, as strongly as I can, encourage you first to mark it and second to memorize it, <laughs> okay? Because I promise you that you, you'll, you'll, you'll find a time to use this verse, right? You look at Romans chapter number 8 and look at verse 18. Let's all read this verse out loud together. Romans 8, 18, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see that there? There are several things in that verse that, that God tells us that are reality. One is the sufferings of this present time. Two is the glory which shall be revealed. That's good to know. <laughs> so if, if you don't yet have that verse underlined or highlighted or marked in your Bible, please do it now. But more importantly, get it, get it memorized in your soul. Get it in your soul. Because again, I, 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 I promise you, you will use that verse at some point in your life, okay? <laughs> what, what's that? Yeah, Ken says every morning when you get up out of bed, right? <laughs> so so that, that, that's very good. All right, let's, uh, let's then get on with our lesson today. We're, gonna, we're back in Colossians and chapter number two here. So turn with me over to Colossians and chapter number two. We do want to welcome once again all the folks listening by way of uh, the internet, joining us online. And we do want to mention again, as I mentioned at the previous service, we recognize that our markers up here they're really hard to see on the whiteboard online, and we're, we're trying, to, trying to resolve that issue. We've got different markers, and some work better than others and so forth, but we're definitely trying to resolve that issue here. Steve has been very helpful in trying to do that. In fact, he has a specific task between now and next week. So next week, what he's going to come is, instead of with markers, he's going to come with a, a paintbrush and a paint can. And <laughs> we just paint it. No, no, I'm just joking there. All right, where are we at? We're at Colossians chapter number 2. And we're going to go back to verse 5. We, we got down to verse 5 and a little bit of verse 5 last time. So chapter 2, verse 5, he says this, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Let's you not our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time that we can open your word and allow your word to uh, really get deep into our heart and to our soul and provide for us your counsel, and especially in in this setting here, this context here, the counsel of how we go about just conducting our life on a on a day-by-day -day basis, moment-by-moment -moment basis, and that is, of course, to live out of Christ as our resource, as our very life, and that that's how that order and steadfastness actually is produced. So we thank you, Father, for the wisdom and understanding we will receive this morning. We do, Father, uh, Pray especially this morning for uh, uh, Lori and Garrett Kaler with not just the arrival of their new, newest granddaughter, but especially this, the continued health situation with her mom and then her dad having to, to be so involved in, in helping his dear wife through all this and the physical infirmities that they're experiencing. We pray, God, that you might provide for them that comfort and that strength that comes from resting in their identity in Christ Father, we recognize that they're not the only ones that are a part of the ministry here that uh, have physical infirmities or others that are right here with us in the local ministry and others listening by way of the internet and, and online and that will listen to the re re these recorded messages. Uh, Father, we pray that each and every one they might make that conscious choice to trust you even in the midst of the sufferings of this present time, not you as the source of the affliction, as the one who sent the affliction, but the one who provides the comfort and the strength in your word to sustain us.
through whatever the affliction might be, and in so doing, reminding us about the fact that eternity lies ahead. It's an eternity that is forever, and it will be filled with glory, and all by your grace. Well, thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you look with me again at verse 5, so we're at chapter number 2, verse 5. He says, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And as we began to look at these verses last week, we emphasized that idea. You see the order and the steadfastness? Do you see those two words there? What does that make you think of when, you, when those two words, order and steadfastness? What's that make you think of? Discipline. Uh, discipline? Okay. What, what else? Not being moved away. Not, not being, moved away, not being shaken. Uh, what's that? Perseverance. Perseverance. So st- stability, right? So when you look at how he says it there, uh, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. It's clear that, that someone wants to move them away from that. Everybody see that there? The fact that he's, rejo- he's commending them for the fact that they're, they're having their personal trust and confidence in the Lord. And that's what's bringing about that spiritual stability. Ken, did you have a question or a comment there real quick? It really does. The order and the, what Ken said is the order and the steadfastness makes you think of that, that they have a common doctrine that is providing that stability. Now, I want to focus then for a few more moments here. Notice right at the end of verse 5 when he talks about joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your, then what does he say there? Your faith in Christ, oops, let me just fix that there. So when he's saying that, what is it they were trusting about Christ? What is it they were trusting about Christ when he said, your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ? What did Christ do for them? Christ, Christ died for their sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day. What's that mean? When, when Christ died for their sins, what, what's, what's that all about? He, 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 his death on the cross, his shedding the blood there, his blood there, is what really and truly paid the full price of all accountability that they would all accountability that they would ever have to give to God for their sins, paid in full. And his resurrection is the evidence of that. They, they, they'd come to trust that for their personal salvation. And they, they got saved. A question, how come when they believed that, how come they got saved? Because why? Yeah, so what, how come they got saved the moment? Let me ask this way. When you trusted the blood of Christ for your personal salvation, how come you got saved at that split second and saved forever? How, how come? Because yeah, you believed what God said about that. That's why. You got saved because God did something. Not because you did something. You, got, you trusted what someone else did for you. And the moment you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your personal salvation, God acted. By the way, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And you were taken out of Adam and placed into Jesus Christ, something that can never be reversed. So it's real critical when he says there that he was joined and beholding their order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ, your confidence in Christ, And what he did for you. Christ provided an absolute, perfect, complete, nothing lacking, standing with God the Father. You hear what I said there? Christ provided an absolute, perfect, complete, 
nothing lacking, standing in the sight of God the Father. In this same chapter, by the way, look a little bit further ahead, chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10, it says this, And ye are what? Have you all seen that before? Every time you're looking up here at the pulpit, it's right there, isn't it? And ye are complete in him. To be complete, what does that mean? What's the word complete meaning? Nothing lacking. Nothing lacking. Okay. So, are you complete in Christ? How did you get that way? How did you get that way? Isn't it because you trusted what Christ did, right? When Paul is commending them, the order and the steadfastness of their faith in who Christ was. Christ claimed to be a lot of things, and, and the resurrection proved that all his claims were true. So they trusted him to be the Savior that he died for them to be. That, that's the most important decision that anyone ever lived has got to make in, during this dispensation of grace. Whatever, else, whatever other decision that you make, get that one settled. You understand that? Whatever other decision you make in your life, career-wise, who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, this, there's no more important than this one, this decision right here. Now, what Sean mentioned just a moment ago there, too, is Paul not only talks about your faith in Christ, but the reason that that is valid, the reason that you can have faith in Christ is because of the faith of Christ. You see those two little words that are different? Okay. Two little words there. The phrase, faith in Christ, who is that looking to? Who is that pointing to? That's really talking about us trusting Christ. The phrase, faith of Christ, who does it sound like that that's pointing to? That's, that's him, isn't it? Right? The reason that faith in Christ results in all that it results in is because Christ is faithful. It's because of the faith of Christ. We often talk about eternal security. Once you trust the Lord Jesus Christ for your personal salvation, how long are you saved for? You're saved forever. Well, why? Are, are, do you ever sin again? So don't you lose your salvation if and when you sin again? Especially if you sin and you don't repent before you die, then don't you lose? Why are you saved forever? He, when you trusted Christ for your salvation, how many of your sins were forgiven right then and right there? They were all forgiven already. They were forgiven on what basis? Were they forgiven on the basis that you promised God you would do better next time? They were forgiven on what basis? The, the blood of Christ. So God looks to the payment, which was the, the shed blood of Christ at the cross, as the just basis, the righteous basis, upon which to forgive you. He never looks to the conduct of the person that is forgiven as the basis upon which to forgive them. He's not looking at the conduct. He's looking at the person and the work of Christ. The reason you're eternally secure is because God's justice really and truly was satisfied once and for all by the blood of Christ. So he forgives us not by looking at our past, present, or future conduct, that's been dealt with by the cross of Christ already. He forgives us based upon the value of the blood of Christ. Any questions about that? John, go ahead, sir. That's a tough one for me. Uh, so even if I sin and I don't repent, if I'm in the midst of the sin, whatever it is, and I die in a car accident or whatever. 
which by the way, don't. I'm sure your wife doesn't want to say goodbye to you, but anyway, go ahead. He's, he's regenerated, yeah, yeah. How does that, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. Look, look at a couple of verses. Does everybody understand the question, Aaron? Yes. It, it, it's, not, it's not so much a question of the nature or the degree of the transgression or the sin. Adam and Eve, what was the sin that they committed in the garden? They, they didn't trust the Lord. They ate the forbidden fruit. I mean, so what we tend to do is we tend to uh, categorize sins and therefore punishment in relationship to God based upon how we think how bad that particular sin is. So we're, when people have the idea that, well, what if I commit this sin or this, or this sin? Well, what about the other sins? So, so we, have, we all have our sins that we're okay with and that, we're, that therefore we think, well, God's okay with, but the big ones, okay, well, now that, but that, so that's kind of a place to start. The blood of Christ, when you trust Christ for your salvation, how many of your sins did he forgive you of? Let's look at some scripture here. You're in the book of Colossians, right? Look at Colossians 2. Watch verse 13. It says this, and you, Colossians 2, 13, it says, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, so that was our condition before we got saved, hath quickened, to, so made alive, together with him, having, so that sounds like past tense, forgiven, that sounds like past tense, you, how many trespasses? So that's what it says, right? Everybody see that there? So how many of your trespasses were forgiven you the moment you trusted Christ? All of them. So how many? So we might think, well, what about future sins that I haven't committed yet? Okay, well, what about those? Was that, Tom? Yeah, all of our sins were future when Christ died for us. He died for us 2,000 years ago. Future sins is never the issue, not the issue. Future sins is not the limiter. It's not the boundary. It's not that which hinders. Isn't that interesting? That all of our sins were future when Christ died for us on the cross. He, before we were ever born, he knew that we would be born and would need a Savior. He died way back then for us here now. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that wonderful to know that? So the scripture says, even if we don't fully grasp the reality and, and the wonder of it, he clearly says, have forgiven you all trespasses. In order for him to do such a thing, knowing that we would even sin after we're saved, that points back to, therefore, the value of the work of Christ at the cross, the shedding of his blood, has to be of such value, such merit, such priceless nature, that it really did satisfy the justice of God for all of our sins. See how it takes us back and say, wait a minute, if the payment's the blood of Christ, and if that really paid for all of my sins, then what must the value of the blood of Christ actually be? The value is in the blood of Christ. Look with me to Ephesians 1. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at how he says it over here. Ephesians 1. Watch verse uh, 6. It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So that's his, what's his grace? That's his favor, his unconditional favor. His, his favor given to us completely apart from our worthiness of it. There's no, no bearing at all to whether we deserve it or don't deserve it. Nothing, all right? It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he, that's going to be God the Father, is in the context here, he hath made us accepted where? Where does it say there? 
Who is the beloved? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So has God accepted us in ourselves? I, I should have got a stronger answer to that one. <laughs> Come on now. Has God accepted us in ourselves? He hasn't, has he? Where has he accepted us? Acceptance is in Christ. So the acceptance is not based upon who we ever wore or whatever we promise God to do next time. It's not based upon our worthiness. It's based upon the worthiness of Christ. How worthy is Christ? Complete. So when you trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation, God, the Holy Spirit in particular, baptized you into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He placed you into Christ. So when God sees Christ, who does he see? I want to hear your name. <laughs> okay. When God sees Christ, who does he see? If, if this is true, who does he see? I want to hear your name. I want to hear a name. That, that verse says, look at verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted because we promised we wouldn't sin again. He made us accepted because we made a commitment to him. We, he made us accepted because we dedicated, we invited, we... No, 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 no. It's none of that stuff. That's all human religion, human works. That verse says, wherein he hath made us accepted. So who's doing the work there? God the Father is. Where did he make us accepted? Where did he make us accepted? In the beloved. Who's the beloved? That's Christ. So when the Father looks to Christ, tell me someone he sees. Someone that you know really personally well, better than anybody else. I want a name. I want, I want a name. Tell me a name. Everybody tell me a name. Don't tell me the person, the name person sitting next to you. Tell me your name. If you've trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation, God sees you in Christ. So how, I'll get you in a minute. So how should you see you? Because that's how he sees you. What do you. By the way, what do you think about that? If, if this is true, by the way, it is. <laughs> okay. This is wonderful. This, this has no equal. This has no parallel. It has no match. He made us accepted in the beloved. Now, I know we've looked at this before. We're going to look at this again. Hold Ephesians 1. Please turn with me to Matthew 3 and Luke 3. We're going to key on that phrase, the beloved. The beloved. Okay? So, so I, I think everybody here, you... You, you have this, this comparison marked in your Bible. If not, please do it now. Look over to Matthew 3. I want you to see a phrase here. Look over to Matthew 3. Matthew 3, watch this, at uh, verse uh, 16. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 says this, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now watch very carefully verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying. Now this is going to be God the Father saying this from heaven. It, so Christ comes up out of being baptized by John. This is my beloved son. You see the word beloved? This is my beloved son. Now, what does he go on to say there? How does he clarify, qualify beloved son? Say out loud, everybody. What's he say there? So by definition, to be God's beloved son means what? Say it loud, everybody. In whom he is well pleased. Is God well pleased in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What does God think about the son? He's his beloved son, the one in whom he is well pleased. 
Does God ever find fault with his son? Is God ever out of favor with his son? Does God find his very purpose and reason for existing in his son? The answer is yes. That verse says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's recorded a little differently in Luke 3. And it is significant, the the way it's recorded differently in Luke 3. Look over how he says it in Luke and chapter number 3 and verse 22. Look at Luke 3, 22, if you would please. Look at Luke 3 and verse 22. It says, the setting is the same here. He, He is baptized by John. Verse 22, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, here it is, Thou art my beloved Son, in Thee I am well pleased. By the way, did did you notice that clearly it's different? Did you all notice that there? The record in Matthew, the Father breaks the silent heavens, And says, for the benefit of the audience, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He says that for the benefit audibly of the audience. This is one of the few times during the ministry of Christ when God actually breaks the silence of heaven and says something. There's only about three times if I remember, maybe four, I think it's three times. Where the, where the Father actually breaks the silence of the heavens and speaks audibly. That here in, in Matthew 3, it says this. See how he's, he's saying to the nation, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He says that for the benefit of the audience. But notice how he said it in Luke 3. He said it different here. Luke 3, verse 22, right towards the end. Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Who is he saying that for there? He's saying that specifically and exclusively for Christ. Isn't that wonderful there? Now, I I took the time to do that, go back to Ephesians 1. So when we think of the phrase, the... Beloved, what should we connect with that phrase? In whom the Father's well pleased. Every time you think of that phrase, we're made accepted in the beloved. Well, who's the beloved? That's Christ. But who is Christ to the Father? He's the one in whom the Father is well pleased. Does everybody, you see those connections so far? I have a question for you. According to Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 6, please, if you would. To the, verse 6, Ephesians 1, 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He, the Father, hath made us accepted where? And who is the beloved? What's His name? The Lord Jesus Christ. And what does it mean that He is the beloved? He is well pleased. Question. He's well pleasing to the Father. According to that verse right there, when you trusted Christ for your salvation, you got placed into Christ, right? Yes or no? So how does God see you? He sees you in Christ and therefore... Can that be true? Is it true? You understand what I'm asking? I I didn't write that verse. It's a pretty good one, though. (laughs) But do you see how in in our minds we fight this, don't we? We all have our, well, yeah, but what about? And and then we fill in the blank. What about about this? What about this? Well, what about all that? God looks to Christ. Our acceptance is in Christ. We've been forgiven and placed into Christ. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise in Christ. We've been made complete in Christ. 
and he didn't do any of those things based upon what we would do with the free gift of salvation after we received it. It really and truly is a free gift. People will say, well, then you can just go abuse it. Well, yeah, of course you can. It wouldn't be grace if it couldn't be abused. But just because you can abuse it, does that mean we should? It means we have a choice now as to whether or not we're going to live out of the love and the acceptance that he has given to us in Christ or simply live for self. It's a choice you make. It's a free will choice. Isn't that wonderful? So is it true that believers can and will and do sin, sometimes even quote-unquote bad sins, whatever that means, okay, right? Is it true that believers can and will and do sin after they get saved? Well, how do you know? Because I am one. <laughs> That's how I know. <laughs> I have the same. Someone we, I was talking to earlier with a brother here, and, and uh, he, 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 he said something about the idea that, well, thank you for putting up with me. He said, why do you put, I think he said, why do you put up with me? And, he said, and I said, and I meant this really, I said, because you put up with me. I, I heard J. Vernon McGee say this a long time ago, and he's been with the Lord for, what, 35, 40 years now and everything. And he, I heard a record, I didn't hear him personally, I heard on the radio, he said something like this. He, he was preaching to, to, at his church and everything, and he said something along these lines. He said, man, if, if I knew the things that you people did this week and that you thought, thought about this week and that went through your mind this week, if I knew those things, I don't know if I'd ever preach to you again. I'd be embarrassed to be with you. And of course, he stuns the audience like, wait, wait, <laughs> was he checking my, what happened? And then you know what he said following that? He said, but if you knew the things that went through my mind this week, you'd never listen to me again. See that? We all have the same flesh, but we all have the same Savior. And the reason that we have been totally, completely forgiven is because of the work of the Savior. He's the Savior. We are not co-saviors with him to rest in Christ. You're there in Ephesians chapter number one. Look at Ephesians chapter number one. Look at verse six, and now we're going to go to verse seven. He says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the blood. In the blood. Oh, believe it, believe it, believe that you have been made accepted in the blood. You know why? Because it's true. It's true. That's what it says. Even if we don't understand how that's even possible, God says it's true. And what we do is we study and learn more and more and go, oh, now we see how this even was possible. And, of course, it's by the work of Christ at the cross. He goes on to say this. Look at verse 7. He says, in whom? So who's, who's the whom in verse 7? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the beloved. So in whom we have. So it's a present possession, Right? In whom we have redemption, that's the payment of the full price. To redeem something, you paid the price to set it free, to claim it as your own. You see that word, the redemption? That's a great word. He says, in whom we have redemption. What are the next three words there? L let me read it differently. In whom we have redemption through his blood, plus when we promise to do better next time. Through his blood, plus when we make a commitment to serve him and not sin anymore. But isn't that how we tend to think? That I, I will I'll really have this redemption when I demonstrate I'm worthy of it. Or when I become worthy of it. Or when, I, when I've obeyed enough verses. When I've really taken up my cross and followed Jesus. It, it, isn't that what they say? The Lord Jesus Christ says things that, that if you don't take your cross and follow me, you're not worthy to be worthy to be my disciple. So then the idea of, well, I got to be worthy. So they're, they're mixing the programs and so forth, right? The, the, over in the book of Revelation, all seven of the letters in Revelation chapter two and three, those seven letters, the seven churches and so forth, so forth, all seven of those letters start with, I know thy works. And all seven of them end, somewhere towards the end of each of those letters, says to him that overcometh. 
Does that sound like grace? Or does that sound like the law program? Do you see how simple that is? But people will do that. They'll run to the book of Revelation. They'll run to the book of Hebrews. They'll run to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He that endures till the end. Take up your cross and follow me. If you taste and you depart, you're never going to come back and so forth. Well, they're mixing in the two programs. Go ahead, Rich, quick, quickly. Whoa, is it, say that loud, please. It makes you think that not only you have to do something, but you can. But then doesn't that produce, well, see what a good deal, God, you got when you saved me. Man, heaven is going to be such a better place because I'm going to be there. Is it what our flesh thinks? Now, keep reading if you would, and, and I know I'm, I'm at just about out of time here, but look at verse 7. It says, in whom we have redemption, watch this, the sole ground of your redemption is the blood of Christ, period. The sole ground of your redemption is the blood of Jesus Christ, his work at the cross of Calvary. That's the sole ground. That's the sole thing that God looks to to satisfy his justice upon which to forgive you of all your sins and place you into Christ. He says it this way, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to what standard? What's it say there? The riches of his grace. Let's just use a silly illustration. Let's say that God was to say to us here today or whoever, he said, tell you what, I will forgive you of your sins according to the riches of your bank account. I'm doomed for sure. <laughs> All right. So, some might receive more than others, right? Because this guy might have a hundred bucks, the other guy might have a hundred thousand in his checking account. The other guy might have a million. You might be Elon Musk and have billions. So theoretically, if God was going to forgive someone according to the riches of our bank accounts, then theoretically Elon would get a whole lot more forgiveness than me. For example, you see the concept there? So I'm using that as an illustration. That verse does tell us the standard. That verse does tell us the measuring stick that God looks to and reaches into to forgive you of your sins. What is, in the verse, what is the standard? The riches of his bank account, not my bank account. The riches of his grace. What's his grace? That's his kindness, his love given freely. You know, someone says, hey, show me your bank account. You say, yeah, watch this. I got a bunch of zeros on the wrong side of the little dot. <laughs> right? God says, well, come here. Let me show you my bank account. And the statement is named the riches of God's grace. So it says, let's open this vault. The vault of this bank account. I'm going to give you my, I, God says, I'm going to show you my monthly and actually eternal statement to my bank account called the riches of God's grace. And he opens up his book and here's the statement. Here it is. All the details. Do you see how rich you are in Christ? God forgives us. The extent of the forgiveness he gives to us is not by looking at our bank account, our net worth, but his net worth, the riches of his grace. So how forgiven are you? You're only forgiven to the extent of how wealthy he is in his grace, that's all. So who do you think's more wealthy, Elon Musk or God? By the way, who, who are some of the richest men alive right now? The gazillionaires, whatever. <laughs> like Musk and then Buffett and whatever, all those kind of things, people. What, what was Buffett's right-hand guy that died? Was it earlier this year or last year? Was it um, Charlie Munger? And they reported that, that uh, um, when, when he died, that what was his net worth? I don't know, billions. But you realize he left every penny of it. He didn't take one penny with him, not one. When God forgive, forgave you of all of your sins, 
It's, he opened his bank account called the riches of his grace. And God said, that's how, that's how forgiven you are. So he doesn't forgive us based upon the number of sins that we're going to commit in a lifetime or even the nature and the quality or how bad or good those sins were in our lifetime. He forgives us because of the blood of Christ. The things that are equal are the blood of Christ and the riches of his grace. The value is in the blood of Christ. The reason he can forgive us according to the riches of his grace is because of the priceless nature of the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You see how it keeps looking to him, to him, to him, to him. We're going to wrap it up here. It, their faith in Christ, the reason that had any value was because of the faith of Christ because of the value of the person. And next week, we'll take a real a deeper dive on that, the faith of Christ. Okay, Ken first, and then Brother Cash. Ken, go ahead. You've had your hand up there for a week already. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? It's not reference to whether or not our conduct is going to be better. It's reference to our new identity in Christ. We get things according to the riches of That's Christ. That's correct. Yes, yeah. but according to. Amen. Uh, Cash, go ahead, and then Katie, go ahead. Uh, Okay, they're not synonymous, but they're absolutely linked. The faith of Christ, that looks to his fidelity, what he did. The reason the blood of Christ had the value that it does is because he was faithful to the word of God. If he had sinned even one time then he would not have been faithful, so his, val his blood would not have had any value at all. So they're not synonymous, but they're absolutely linked. And we'll talk more about that next time, the faith of Christ. Someone else had their hand up. Katie, did you have a comment or question? Yeah, it just makes me think about that's a standing and not our standing. That's exactly correct. And that kind of ties back with what Ken was saying, that our, our standing is who we are in Christ. The conduct in our life has to do with our state right now. So what we want to do by growing in God's word, God's word identifies for us, it teaches, it shows us, yeah, this, this thinking process is not appropriate. This thinking process will lead to this conduct, which is not appropriate, but God doesn't love us less or, or kick us out or reject us. What the scriptures do, they teach us how to change our thinking process. And therefore, the conduct that is produced will be different because it comes from a different thinking process, a different source and resource. Uh, Rich, go ahead. The concern for the Colossians is they would get, when it came to their conduct, they'd get off track from the other main things they keep focused on. That's correct. What Rich is bringing up here is that Paul is going to go on to say in Colossians chapter number two there is that the adversary was wanting to get the Colossians off track, focusing on their conduct. And the more you focus on your conduct, who do you focus on? Self. And the more we focus on self, the more we focus on conduct. And then we focus on self, and then that becomes a vicious cycle. So instead, what the Apostle Paul is doing here in Colossians 2, he's conveying to the Colossians, let's Let's kind of break this cycle <laughs> by instead of focusing our conduct, by focusing on our conduct and therefore ourselves, let's look at who we are in Christ and let's learn to let that be the glasses, the perspective, the view that we deal with life. Isn't that wonderful? Think about that. Salvation, oh, wow, it really is by grace through faith alone. It really is a free gift, really and truly. Really. I mean, I mean it. <laughs> and whether or not I mean it, the Bible means it. It really and truly is a complete, total free gift. 
and resting in that, that's how that brings about that order and the steadfastness. We have confidence in Christ, not in self. I'll ask Brother Henry if he'll come on up and we'll close in song here. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time to look into your word. Father, we thank you for this local assembly here where we can just uh, openly discuss, openly bring up questions, so helpful questions and concerns that uh, we can allow your scripture to answer for us. And uh, grow together and edify one another and have our hearts knit together in love and to manifest the reality of the oneness of what it means to be in Christ, members one of another. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your kindness, and your love toward us through the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that you made us accepted in, the one that in whom you are well pleased. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.